If you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Words taken from St. John's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The year was 474 A.D., and it seemed like it was the end of the world for many people. The Roman Empire was in a state of utter collapse. Barbarian tribes were wreaking havoc. There were also natural disasters and even demonic activity that manifested God's just wrath against the people. In a city called Vienne, located in a territory of Gaul, the people were suffering terribly. The historical books tell us that Gaul was, quote-unquote, groaning and bleeding due to the invasion of the Huns and the Goths. And furthermore, there were earthquakes that had shaken the city repeatedly, causing many houses and even churches to collapse. And then, on Easter Day itself, a fire descended from heaven and engulfed the king's palace in flames. Whole forests were consumed by an unprecedented conflagration. Such disasters forced many animals, including wolves and bears, to enter into the towns and cities of the people of Gaul. And the chroniclers then record that demons began to enter into the wild beasts which roamed about and even devoured small children and many elderly people. Again, it seemed as if it were the end of the world. The bishop of the area that was most affected by these disasters was named St. Mamertus. This holy man knew that the sins of the people were the catalyst of such troubles. St. Mamertus had recourse to prayer. And while prostrate before the altar of God, he was inspired to institute a special period of fasting, of prayer, of litanies, and processions on those three days that preceded the ascension. Through these acts of penance, the people would supplicate the good Lord to have mercy, to relieve the suffering, and to bless the crops during the coming year. Today, in the old calendar, this special three-day period is called the Minor Rogation Days. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, we will renew this ancient practice through reciting litanies and psalms seeking to appease God's just wrath and to ask for blessings upon our agricultural pursuits. Now, the word rogation comes from the Latin word rogare, which means to ask or to pray. And so rogation days are days during which we ask for God's mercy. We seek to pray to appease his anger and to avert his chastisements manifested oftentimes through natural disasters and even demons being further unleashed. And finally, we ask for his blessings, particularly with regard to farming and gardening. Now, these days are set aside by the church to remind us just how radically dependent we are upon Mother Earth and how prayer can help protect us from nature's often cruel ways. But more importantly, these days remind us of the absolute necessity of prayer, that prayer is owed to Almighty God, that prayer alone can turn divine wrath into divine mercy, that prayer, regular prayer, is absolutely necessary for our salvation. In a number of traditional parishes, special processions and rogation masses will be offered where violet, the color of penance, will be worn by the priest. There is a medieval description of the procession which will give us just a glimpse of the devotional life of our ancestors and will also show us what many modern Catholics have lost. The old records from the Middle Ages state that in the procession 
the Rogation mass procession, the cross was borne aloft and the bells of the churches were rung. Furthermore, holy banners were carried, and in some churches, even a figure of a red dragon with a great tail was lifted up. And during this time, the people begged mercy and assistance in their litanies and psalms. Now, the chroniclers of the Middle Ages offered this interpretation. The reason why the cross was borne aloft and the bells were rung was to make the evil spirits afraid and to force them to flee. The pealing of those baptized and consecrated bells are the voice of Christ's victory over hell and his triumph over Satan and the spirit of the world. If earthly kings have in their battle their own banners, their standards for the king, so it is only proper that the king of heaven has the sign of the cross and banners carried into battle by members of what is called the church militant. According to writers of the past, the bells were also rung during great storms so that the demons should cease disturbing the atmosphere. And yes, these same bells would call the people to prayer for only through divine assistance could we survive nature's cruel blows. For this reason, too, Christians of the past would erect a cross in the face of a violent storm so that the wicked spirits would see the banner of the sovereign king and for fear of the sign of salvation, they would flee and calm and tranquility would return. Therefore, in those ancient processions during the Rogation days, the cross was borne aloft and those bells were rung in order to chase away demons in the air and to end all their disturbances. The cross again was borne aloft in order to represent the victory of Christ by his saving death and through his physical resurrection and his ascension to glory. And to this day, All these holy processions demonstrate that the members of the church militant are a marching people. We are marching with Christ towards the heights of heaven. That with his ultimate victory, he has taken the spoils of war from the devil. That he invaded even the devil's house and released those prisoners in the limbo of the fathers. And like a great pioneer... The ascended Christ has blazed a trail upwards that we follow in procession from behind. What about that red dragon that was mentioned? That red dragon, it was also a part of the procession back in the Middle Ages. The chroniclers explained that in some churches, especially in France, it was a custom to bear a dragon with a long tail in the procession. The first two rogation days, Monday and Tuesday, the dragon was born in front of the cross, before the cross. But on the third day, the red dragon was carried after the cross with its tail cut off. The reasoning for the dragon's presence in front of the cross on the first two days demonstrated the time of the devil's reign. The devil's reign after the fall of Adam and his reign even after the giving of the law. But on the third day of the procession, that Wednesday of those minor rogation days, the dragon loses its place to the cross, signifying that the passion of Christ ushered in a new age of grace that has toppled Satan from his throne. In our modern age, where we're so enlightened. Penitential processions are largely a thing of the past. Many feel that Mother Nature can be tamed, even artificially manipulated. We can tamper with the environment and remake it, refine it according to our own enlightened man-made vision. We, are, we see ourselves not so much as stewards of the earth in this modern age, but rather outright owners who can exploit Mother Nature at will. But on the other side, 
other modern people wrongly deify nature and pervert ecology, making it into the pseudo-religion of environmentalism. Man, in this vision, loses his dignity as steward and custodian of the earth and is seen, rather, as an unwanted parasite whose numbers must be reduced for the sake of the environment. And finally, there are those who always sentimentalize nature, seeing it only through the lens of a Robert Frost poem or a Courier and Ives painting. And thus they forget just how cruel nature can be. Rogation days are helpful then in giving us a proper Christian view of things. The earth is truly a mother to us, and we are very dependent upon all her great treasures. She is not to be toyed with. We are to be just stewards, watching over this natural gift, accepting the order and nature of things according to the divine plan. The litanies, the prayers, and penitential practices connected with these days remind us that nature can turn savage. One writer I read stated that Mother Nature can turn ugly and cruel in its ways and is often an instrument of divine wrath turned against his rational creatures below. From bothersome thistles in our fields to the horror of cataclysmic events, nature provides challenges to us. The writer then listed various events. Ash and fire raining down from great volcanoes. Waters bursting through levees. Mountainous tidal waves destroying miles of coastland and entire villages. Meteors hurling to the earth. Tornadoes and hurricanes sweeping away all in their path. Droughts, floods, fires that rampage through forests and towns, avalanches of snow or rocks, yes, causing great damage, and even cataclysmic events forming mountains and islands, killer plagues, the earth opening up beneath our feet. These, too, are part of the natural world. And though nature seems random and fickle, all that happens, remember, all that happens is either by God's active or passive will. Nothing is outside of his control. And all throughout Scripture, in the Holy Bible, God uses the elements to warn us, to punish us, to humble us, and yes, to instruct us. And so we read of the earth swallowing up the rebellious, we read in the Bible of the wind destroying houses and killing its inhabitants in the book of Job. We read about fire raining down on Sodom and Gomorrah and water destroying everyone but Noah and his family. We need to be humble and respectful of nature and be aware not to take her for granted or overstep our limits. But we need to be most especially humble before her Creator who wills her existence and doings at each instant, whether actively or passively. Again, nothing is outside of God's control. The most deplorable evil of our day, finally, is that men have largely ceased to pray. Rogation days, it seems, are for men of the past, for medieval men, unevolved, and unenlightened. They fear the forces of nature. I guess we don't. Prayer would suggest that we're dependent upon somebody else. Prayer would be an acknowledgement of our own nothingness before the Most High. Prideful modern man will have none of this. And our rebellion and our lack of prayer finds expression in the disturbances that surround us. There are now harsher storms. There are mega-tornadoes, tsunamis, 
devastating fire, consuming forests and whole neighborhoods and towns. And with our prideful minds, we attribute this all to CO2 emissions. If only we had less of a carbon footprint, then everything would be fine. If only we aggressively brought about a population implosion in order to deal with the supposed population explosion, we can save ourselves, or so we think. But there will be no true tranquility in nature without peace with Almighty God. Nature will cease to strike us so cruelly and will truly serve man once we have appeased the wrath of the Creator. Living the rogation days well during those three days that precede Ascension Thursday will help save our souls. It will calm the anger of Mother Earth and it will grant divine blessings upon our agricultural pursuits. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.